Yeah, my name is Jeb Fields, and I know a lot of you read the title of this talk, uh, Gardening in the Deep South, the Cajun Way. And there's a little funny story about that. Unfortunately, I am not Cajun. I know I don't sound Cajun. There's going to be no good gumbo talks or things like that. I am very, uh, hardly a Flor uh, Louisianian um, from Florida. But it's a funny story. When I first got hired, uh, Dr. Creech called me and said, can you give a talk at one of the lectures? I said, absolutely. Um, can I do it on stuff that I know at the time? Because I came out of my PhD and my uh, schooling in a nursery production uh, setting. I really worked on soilless media and container potting soils, basically. And I said, I could talk about that. And he said, no, this, people don't want to hear that. They want to hear about plant material. So <laughs> I said, all right, well, give me a little bit, and I'll come up. I'll talk about the gardens. And he asked for a title. I said, I'll get back to him. And I guess I didn't get back to him soon enough. So he said, I'll just make one up for you. Gardening in the Deep South, the Cajun Way. So uh, that is how this title came. But what this is really going to be is I'm going to talk about some observations I have from the Hammond Research Station, our trial gardens, really tell you about the gardens, tell you about what we do there, and then get into some fun, talk about our actual plant trials and some of my favorite plants that we have there. Uh, just doubling... Uh, but yeah, before that, I do want to say, so what I am is I am the statewide commercial ornamental horticulture extension specialist. And so I don't know if you all know what extension means, but it basically I go out and I talk to farmers. I work in the field a lot. I do not teach. I'm not a lecturer. So by habit, I'm interacting with the crowd. So if you have questions or comments throughout this, please just yell at me. Uh, don't wait till the end like a good class would. That's not how I do my thing. So uh, you're not going to throw me off. Um, and like I said, mostly what my research and extension focus on is nursery production, uh, and I consider it environmental nursery production. I'm very interested in resource efficiency, soilless media, water, fertilizer, uh, becoming more sustainable in our landscape and our nursery settings, uh, both financially, economically, and environmentally. So I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's where I am. And I say that all for you to know that the uh, gardens and the plants I'm talking about, I am not a plantsman by trade. So... Um, this is just my favorite plants. You're not going to get too technical on these. These are things that I think look great in the landscape and that I'm learning over years. So if you know stuff that I don't or have any thoughts, comments, please tell me. Uh, but this is the Hammond Research Station. This is a fantastic photo. I show this all the time that our research associate Ashley took uh, in the sunset. Uh, it's kind of hard to see from here, but we have a uh, different way of doing things, and I'll talk about how we do our trials in a really landscape setting. But what really works for me and why I love it there is the mission for the um, Hammond Research Station is twofold. They both are what I'm very interested in. Uh, the first, and I know this is really small and high, but it's to evaluate, promote, and really develop specialty crops for the Louisiana nursery and landscape industry. So we look for plants. We see what's great. We collect plants. We even develop and trial our own plants um, to help support the Louisiana nursery landscape uh, garden center industry. Secondly, the other mission is to enhance production and landscape management efficiency and sustainability through research extension education, which is what I was trained to do and what I really love. So this is a great opportunity and I, a perfect fit for me because what I didn't say is when I first decided to go back to school, I really, I actually uh, contacted NC State, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, that's where I wanted to go to do plant uh, selection and plant ornamental plant breeding. And they didn't have any money for me to go to school, so I ended up going into potting soils, which had money. And so it all was history from there. But so my two big interests in my career are nursery production and plant trials. And so it was a perfect fit. So I'm kind of bragging there. Uh, but so aside, about half of my job is nursery research and extension. And the other half is the Hammond Trial Gardens. And these are the trial gardens just a couple weeks ago at one of our field days. Nope. 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 Bear with me. So what our gardens is, they're fairly unique. Uh, we consider them research-focused fo trial gardens with a landscape design. And what I mean by that is, especially in our bedding plants and our flowers, when you go to a lot of trial gardens around the country, they're going to be in just rows. And you're going to have 9, 15, 12, what have you, of the same plant planted in a block. And then you'll have the next one that's competitor planted in a block right next to it and go so down. And those are so down the line. And that's a great way of doing things. It gets you great data. You see, you can clearly see which is better, which performs better. Ours are a bit different. We actually plant our plants and our trials in a landscape setting, like a landscaper would at a nice 
luxury uh, condo or hotel or at a business or in your yard if you have a really nice yard. So we can actually see how the plants mature in the landscape setting, how they're gonna interact. We have a lot of uh, landscape architects and consumers that come out and visit and they wanna know what to put in their yard because you don't wanna know what it looks like in a block because you're not gonna plant a block of plants, you're gonna plant them in the landscape. So this is what we do that not many trialing park, trial gardens do and this is what kind of sets us apart. As far as our trials, we consider them multifunctional. Um, the first and foremost, the reason we do our trials is to determine what's gonna thrive in our extreme southern climate, and I'm gonna talk about the Hammond climate. You all know extreme weather in just a second, but I'll show you some pictures. And we really wanna provide the industry op with options for plant materials. So like I say, the nursery industry uses us to see what the new plant materials are coming out across the country, which will grow in Louisiana or the Gulf South. The uh, landscape architects, I said, come to see what they want to spec out for their projects. They'll come out and they'll look and want to see what the different trees look like. It wants matured, so we have that there, so we can actually put the right plant in the right place um, and how these mature over time. Uh, we also serve as a repository for potential significant plants. A lot of plants are fantastic and the industry only picks up so many over time and plants come in and out of favor with consumers in the industry over time. And so we serve as a repository for our nursery industry. A lot of these trees, especially in shrubs that may never have caught on or were really popular in the 70s or 80s that have fallen out, but have our great genetic, great potential. We keep those genetics there so our nursery industry can come take cuttings if they say, Jeb, I want to put some, we want to get a new magnolia into our production line or a new deciduous flowering tree. Come out, look at what we got, take some cuttings, we can build your stock from there. And then our other major uh, reason for existing is we work for the industry to drive sales. People come out, they, we promote horticulture just in general uh, with the public, but also our nursery might say, all right, Jeb, we need to really, we have all these magnolias or all these uh, crepe myrtles we want to make sure people see them and see how amazing they are. So we'll display the material from the nurseries in our gardens. So when you come out, you say, this is fantastic. Where do I get it? Go down to your local nursery, and that's how we move. So these are our main functions as a trial garden and the Hammond Research Station Gardens. And this is a picture. Just um, All these pictures are throughout the gardens, and I'll talk about the individual gardens in a bit. Um, this just repeats what I just said, doesn't really need to be said. Uh, evaluate, we evaluate plant material for our extreme uh, conditions, uh, identify potential plant material for our industry, put a plant material on display, yeah, this is the, just a repeat slide, and serve as a repository for plants. This is what I meant. Um, and so here's the Hammond Station, a picture of it. We're actually located in Tangipahoa Parish. Uh, if I was taught very early that there are not counties in Louisiana, which caught me off guard, they're parishes, and I get corrected for that quite a bit, so I'm getting really good at saying that. And our station is actually the second oldest experiment station in Louisiana, and we'll turn 100 years old in 2021, so about a century year old. For the longest time, it was a truck crop station, and, uh, which are like vegetable crops, and strawberry station. Uh, the strawberry industry in Louisiana was right there in Hammond and Ponchatoula next city over. And so that's really what the whole station focused on. And we're about 50 minutes from New Orleans, 50 minutes from Baton Rouge, right in the middle of the major metropolitan area of Louisiana. And so they saw the writing on the wall that the vegetable and strawberry industry were going down in that area and that ornamentals were becoming very popular and very big about 15 years ago. And they... It was about when Katrina came through and cleared out a lot of this land right there. They said, let's make a switch and go to ornamentals and the rest is history. Um, the station itself is about 150 acres and we have about 40 acres in gardens and plant evaluations, which is way too much, but we love it. And so <laughs> there's not too many, not enough of us working there for that much space, but it works. The rest is in labs and buildings. We have some open fields that we have as native Cajun prairies and such and demonstration areas. Like I said, we focus on the nursery and landscape industry. We are a commercial-oriented uh, research station. We're open to the public. We help consumers. We do a lot of consumer events, but we are mainly focused on the industry, landscape, commercial landscapers and uh, wholesale nursery growers. And, of course, we have extreme weather in Hammond. So if you don't know, this is where Hammond's at, just on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Um, let's see. New Orleans is right about here, and Baton Rouge is right about here. So it's right there in that uh, metropolitan corridor. It's on 6B. 
We average about 60 to 70 inches of rainfall. We had 80 some odd inches last year. We're on pace for 80 some odd inches this year. Uh, it is extremely wet. And so we try all things in crazy conditions. Uh, whoop. Whoop. This thing doesn't like me. Um, these are pictures. We, in 2016, we had two floods where our river breached and we were about four to five feet underwater overnight in March and then again in September in 2016. So it rains all year long there. Uh, remember, it's in southern Louisiana. We're a swamp. We've made these the swamps into gardens. So this isn't the flood. This is a normal Tuesday, basically, for us. Um, but when it rains that much, we're likely to get many nights where we'll just have four inches of rain overnight in a couple hours. It just comes down. And when it's been wet that long, it doesn't matter how high we raise the beds, we're going to have drain paths in our garden. So. What we say is that Hammond, when we trial plants at Hammond, if they do well in Hammond, they're going to do well in the entire Gulf South because we're going to be hot. We're going to have hot nights, humid temperatures. They're going to be wet. They have to have wet feet. Uh, this is more of our trialing grounds after we pruned up. This is just the mulch, the pine straw mulch floating above some trials. Just out of some rain, so they have to do well. We also have a lot of storms and high winds that move through here. Uh, you all know you hear about hurricanes and tropical storms in Louisiana. We're right there with that hurricane magnet right at Hammond where we bring it. This is actually two to three weeks ago. Tropical storm Olga came through and a couple tornadoes and downsports shot through the garden and we lost pine trees, snapped over, laid over, which usually pine trees will snap up high. These snapped at the base or pull, uprooted them. Uh, that's actually our research associate on it for scale, crushed plants. And so we deal with this quite often. At least once a year, we're going to have a crazy storm. Uprooted, full-grown holly trees, completely snapped uh, magnolias, which is just crazy. Uh, so plants falling on things. So we put things through the ringer there in Hammond. It's wet, it's rainy, it's windy, stormy conditions. But then every year, without fail, we get droughts. Um, this year, we rained so much, basically every day of the year, up until about August 15th. And then it didn't rain again till the end of October. Uh, and then when those, and that's in, just like y'all know, in southern Louisiana, that is still, you're in the 90 degrees of every day. And when those plants are getting rain every day, basically, at least every other day, and then you stop, we get a lot of drought. And so even though we have irrigation, drip irrigation can only do so much when the plants used to get in that much water. So really erratic, crazy weather conditions. And then, every now and then, whoops, we get snow. Uh, this is great. I lived in North Carolina and Virginia for a while, then I moved back home to Florida for a while, and I took the job at Louisiana, and I drove out on December 8th, 2017. I got in my apartment that I rented, or my house, and went to bed. I didn't furniture. I slept on a blow-up mattress, woke up the next morning, and that's the next morning. It snowed all night, and I was like, where in the heck did I go? Uh, but this is a, a picture I took my first drive into work. Um, it was great. This is a, says, you can't read it, but it says, Sun Garden Plant Evaluations, Can They Take the Heat? And so I just love that. Right? <laughs> I like talking about that. Uh, and then this is a picture of the Sun Garden. These are our trial gardens, just in the snow. I love this picture. And then I took this picture two weeks ago, the same location view. This is what our gardens look like now. So. They go under the snow, they go under the water, we get trees, pine trees fall on them, wind, and so, like I said, we could like to tell breeding companies and universities all around, if the plant grows and survives in Hammond, especially a bedding plant, you can be sure it's going to survive throughout the Gulf South. Oop, oop, this does not like me. Okay. Uh, our station is broke up into quite a few different gardens. We really break them up, just like uh, Stephen F. Austin does, into different gardens, and it's how we can keep doing and move plants around. Um, the first and foremost, the most popular garden we have is the Alan D. Owings Sun Garden. And some of you might know Alan Owings. He was actually, he was one of the people that started the Hammond Station Gardens. He was my predecessor. I took Alan's job when he retired. So he is the grandfather of all this and made this happen. Um, and so we dedicated the sun garden to Alan, and because Alan loved bedding plants, and the sun garden is where all of our bedding plant trials are. 
all of our warm season uh, color, our cool season color, all of our flowers. And when you first drive into the station, you see it. It's what just looks so fantastic and just brings, draws your eyes and brings you in. Um, and so a little map. This is the sun garden right here where it's four. We have the Margie Jenkins Azalea Garden, which if you don't know who Margie Jenkins is, she's like uh, a founding mother of horticulture, especially in Louisiana. She's introduced many azaleas, many plants into the nursery trade. Uh, she is 98 years old, and she still works every day. She, I was at her place two weeks ago, and she was propagating plants, just sitting there telling stories. So she loves it. And so we dedicated a garden to her uh, in 2012, uh, Azalea Garden, where we keep our collection of azaleas. And we keep a lot of Miss Margie's favorite native plants, because she's very interested in native plants, Louisiana natives. And now we've also added to that, and it's more of our understory trial area, where we do a lot of our uh, shadier shrubs. The Piney Woods Garden is one of my favorite gardens out there. It's our biggest garden. It is down here. Um, and this is where we keep our long-term trials and evaluations, our demonstrations. A lot of our uh, repository of genetics, our trees and our shrubs and our woodies are really there. Uh, we get plants from all over the country, all over the world. Many of the plants in the Piney Woods are from right here at SFA. Um, and so this is where I love. It's a lot of the trees that we get, um, and I'll show more pictures of the Piney Woods here in a bit. Shade garden is just as it sounds. It's a nice small little shade garden, 100% shade. Uh, we get some understory ferns and things. Um, nothing too exciting for me at least. Uh, the Hody Wilson Camellia Garden is right across the street. Hody Wilson was a camellia breeder um, decades ago, and he worked at the Hammond Research Station, and he has a lot of his genetics that he started or bred with and plants that he bred that are not in the trade anymore, but they're wonderful camellias, are all saved there in the Hody Wilson Camellia Garden and actually a repository. It was a really neat story. His grandson or great-grandson actually contacted me this past summer, uh, and he was just learning about his great-grandfather. I don't think he knew him or knew much about him, and he found out he's a camellia breeder, and his grandson or great-grandson lived in Tennessee, and so he's like, I'd really love to get some of my great-grandfather's camellias. Obviously, they're not in the trade at all, so we were able to get them cuttings and get them some starts. So that's what's really neat about keeping these genetics around. <coughs> we have an urban forest where we, it's a long-term evaluation of a lot of urban trees, especially for what can be used around power lines in Louisiana that we get the power company come out and learn. Uh, care and maintenance area is just basic research. We have a massive uh, crepe myrtle collection. We have about 85 different varieties of crepe myrtles on trial, and we collect as many as we can. We actually have about five or six more coming this winter, so we're expanding that. And then we have just other evaluations where we do our own selections and we're trying to look for a really interesting plant material ourselves to release throughout the station. But those are the gardens. This is the map. This is what the station looks like. Um, oh, well, well. Oh, that was it. And then one last thing before we get to everything I want to talk about. When I was hired, uh, obviously the gardens are very important to the LSU Ag Center and the community and the state of Louisiana. They're fantastic gardens. They're amazing and people love them. So first and foremost, my job was do not ruin the gardens. <laughs> do not take these down, which of course I wouldn't. But they also wanted me to kind of bring them into the future, keep moving the gardens forward. Uh, so what we did is we looked at a lot of trends around the country that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of yards getting smaller, people doing different things. And so we started some new uh, areas and trials and new air, uh, focal points to look at. This is Ashley Edwards, a research associate and she is very interested in edible landscaping. And so we started an edible landscaping trial area this past summer, just small, see how it goes. And it was a massive hit. People loved it. We got a lot of people talking about it. So Ashley was very excited. She runs that. And um, we're going to expand that next year. I'm a container production guy. I came in and just said, oh, I got to do something that I know at least. So I started container trials which were also small. We got a lot of good feedback from them, and we'll continue with the container trials and expand that into next year. Uh, I don't know if you know what All American Selections are, but it's kind of a national branding um, group that selects some of the best plant material uh, across the country. They have different groups of plants. They have vegetables, they have bedding plants, landscape plants, and they're starting container ornamentals, and we were selected as one of the few uh, container ornamental trial gardens. So now, we'll, starting next year, we'll be trialing plants for all American selections. Um, 
Something we wanted to do is make sure we can get more research and usable information besides just plant material out from the garden. So we're doing some work on sustainable landscape systems. Um, uh, remember we have Jason Stagg does a lot of plant materials for purposes, uh, things where we're doing trials on boxwood replacements or what can grow on, um, in parking lot areas, plant systems like that, native plant grows, butterfly gardens, rain gardens, what have you. Uh, I'm very interested in using landscapes as a remediation tool. A lot of people don't realize that uh, home landscapes create some of the biggest point source, uh, or not point source, biggest pollution, phosphorus pollution in our waterways with the extra fertilizer. So I'm very interested in see how we can use the landscapes to be functional and to help us remediate our water. And so I have a graduate student starting projects doing landscape remediation. Uh, Ashley, our research associate, she's getting her master's. She's really interested in a lot of transplanting and how proper best management practices for transplanting large trees and the best ways you can do that. So she's starting a project on that in the spring. And then the biggest undertaking I may ever do in my career, it seems like, uh, is to move into the future. We're seeing to stay relevant. Everything needs to be online. People, for some reason these days, don't want to go to a garden as much. They want to be able to get the information on the internet, which is sad, but it's just the way it is. And so we are not digital at all, and we are going to move real, completely digital this coming up year. We want Our goal is to have a repository online of every plant in the garden uh, with uh, periodically, periodic ratings, photographs, information about where to plant it, care instructions on the plant, and trial results and ratings. Um, it's a huge undertaking, but I think it's going to be really helpful and beneficial to us at the Ag Center, uh, the state of Louisiana, and the public gardening of Louisiana, the nursery industry. Because now if a nursery grower wants to know something, they've got to call me or come out there. But if they can go online eventually and get the information, it's going to streamline things so much. So this is a huge undertaking, and we're hoping, we've started it, we're hoping that our website is online by this time next year. So it's a long process, but if you ever want some plant information for the south region, southeastern region, hopefully we'll be able to help provide that. And then before I get to plants, I've mentioned these two twice, but I really just need to say I am an administrator basically of the garden. I walk around and every now and then say we needed to get this done or big picture things, point out things. But these two people that work with me are the lifeblood of the gardens of the station. Uh, Ashley Edwards is my research associate, and Jason Stagg is an instructor. Uh, and they basically take care of all the maintenance, the plannings, manage the data. They do the whole thing, the gardening for me. So I just, I'm not going to give a talk without giving them credit. They're who really runs it. I just get the, I get most of the credit for it. So. Okay. Now, what we all want the plants. Uh, I'm going to get to these. Our trials are broken up by horticultural use. Uh, a lot of people ask about botanical use, whether it's annuals, perennials, and that's really, we use more of a horticulture. What you're going to use the plant for, is it a bedding plant, is it a tree, is it a shrub? And so our bedding plants are seasonal color plants. We have warm season and cool season color. And we give these, we rate them monthly at least, and we rate them for overall vigor, flower color, flower density, any pest damage, insect damage, uh, pathogens, bacteria, what have you, just take notes on these. Um, and we do it both in the landscape and some in containers now. Uh, like I said, we do it by use. So our hardy tropicals and our perennials, sometimes we put those and lump those into our bedding plant trials if it calls for it. Sometimes they go into our long-term demonstrations with shrubs. And then we have long-term evaluations are really where a lot of our uh, collections are. And it's also where we do our tree and shrub uh, trials. So I'm going to start with the uh, 2018, just give, run through some of our bedding plants, because this is what most people usually want to see, the flowers, uh, the winters, just real quick. And in our trials, we trial over about 250 to 350 different annual bedding plants every year. Uh, and so it's very vigorous. It's intense. And last year, the number one plant, it got perfect basically ratings across the board all your summer long, uh, were the Lucky Star Pentas. It's a variety by Pan American Seed, uh, especially this deep red one. It was fantastic. There was color all summer that until the first freeze as they grow and they keep blooming. Um, pentas, if you don't know, are probably, in my opinion, the most 
butterfly attracting plant that you could possibly put in your garden. Uh, I've never seen pentas without a butterfly on it. And we, we trialed 15 different types of pentas right next to each other, and this isn't scientific, but when I go out there every day and I see the butterflies on the lucky stars and not on the ones next to it, it means something to me. I think what, the, we, what we see is when we look at closer, the flowers were more open, wider for a longer time than some of the other pentas, which closed or were tighter, and so we just saw more butterfly action and pollinator action on the lucky stars. Um, we have what's called industry, uh, in the top industry selects, and uh, last year we had a few. Two of the biggest ones were one of the uh, industry choice awards was Big Blue Salvia Interspecific. And we planted this in the sun and in part shade, and it did fine in the sun, but in part shade it was just fantastic. It gets about maybe four foot tall with the flower spikes, just a really deep blue, which is always what everyone's looking for, a nice blue salvia. Um, Again, this is just covered with bumblebees. They love this. Uh, a lot of pollinator action on these salvias. And uh, get these, the industry choice, it's not based on my ratings. This is, we have members of the landscape industry, landscape architects, nursery members come out and select their favorite plants. And this was one of the winners last year. The other was uh, a sun patient, which is a vigorous tropical orange. Um, the sun patients are like your impatients, but they can take full sun. A lot of you know that sun, impatients need to be full shade or they're not going to make it, but they have a new variety. Sun pa they're not new. But they have sun patients that are out. Uh, there's some other ones called sun standing that they can take it. But these sun patients were really great. The tropical means they were the variegated. Otherwise, you just get a straight green color and the same flower color. And then the orange was just the highest rated one we had. And for cool season, our industry choice award, uh, Super Tunia Vista Bubblegum. Um, if, you're inter if you're interested in landscape petunias in the south, I can say with serious confidence that this is the best one. Um, these are vigorous. They are hardy. There's so much color density in these. There's a bright color that pops. And they're actually pretty heat tolerant for a petunia. These will keep growing into May or June, even in Louisiana, which is really pushing it for petunias with us. Uh, they'll take the freezes pretty well, um, and they're just a fantastic fast-growing plant, and this is continually, every year, outperforms every other landscape petunia we have. We also have what's called a Consumer Choice Award, um, where we have just the consumers. When someone comes and visits my garden, I always say, tell me what your favorite plants are when you leave, or I have some flags. Put some flags out there, and we collect them every so often. And then we have some consumer events, and we have master gardener events, and we ask them to vote on it, and I tally up all those votes at the end of the year uh, and do a consumer choice. And then last year, it was uh, Star Roses and Plants had Budlia Cran Raz, which was the Consumer Choice Award. And um, this is a but Budlia butterfly bush. Another surprising, all these are pollinator plants. Um, not surprising, actually, but just think about that. But this budley is about maybe three feet tall. It's not a really big one, but it's not a small one by any choice, uh, point. But it's just such strong, vibrant colors, this pink, purplish, cran raz color. It is just delicious looking. And uh, you can see this. It pops out. It stands out. And so this had, like, very significantly by far the most votes from our Consumer Choice Awards. So that was 2018. I kind of just want to run through. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about our warm season and container trials for 2019. These are our best of the best in no particular order, I want to say. So just consider that from this year. Uh, but first, um, Proven Winners put out a couple amazing coleus, and I really like sun coleus. I'm very uh, passionate about it. Uh, and these were fantastic. Uh, they're the Color Blaze uh, series. And this one's wicked hot. It's just a, such a vibrant color. It's a little more compact than a lot of the other coleus. And it's got this really neat foliage uh, texture to it. It really just livens up a garden. It was vigorous. It caught your eye. And it just, there was no problems with it. I couldn't name one problem with it. The only problem is I actually like its sister coleus a bit more. Uh, wicked Witch, also in the Color Blaze uh, series. I was a bigger fan of this one. Uh, both were great. This had more of a, the contrast of colors with the outline. Still had that texture in the leaves. 
This is a bit taller of a coleus, not quite as compact as the uh, Wicked, uh, Wicked Heat. Um, and, but both of them are fantastic coleus. I would highly recommend them. Full sun, they grow great, they're easy to grow. They'll make a hedge, you can cut them, trim them down and keep them lower if you really want to, but I just let them grow. Uh, Coreopsis these weed, this is Superstar from Darwin Perennials. And this is a perennial, we, for our perennial bedding plants, we plant them and then we give them their official trial this, the year after. And so this was planted in 2018. And really when all other similar plants like this were not doing well, because we were so hot and so wet this year, in the wet spots, these just thrived. And usually your Coreopsis aren't gonna do that well when it's extremely wet. And so this one was a big surprise. Superstar uh, from Darwin Perennials. Just great, a uh, great plant. Uh, another perennial that's in our trials, uh, Echinacea. This is Sombrero Trace Amigos. I love Echinacea. Unfortunately, Echinacea don't usually love Louisiana. Uh, it's hot and wet, and they do not do that well when it's wet. But some of them surprisingly did fantastic. And uh, this sombrero is one of the couple that did very well for us, especially the second year. They needed, usually, when I lived up in North Carolina, they're a full sun plant. In Louisiana, we saw if they got part shade, they actually did a lot better that second year. So we recommend them in part shade. We recommend them, and we also pr uh, promote them as annuals, although they are perennials. It's just they don't usually make it too long there. It's too wet in the winter. But not for this one. This one's making it great. Uh, Gallardia, we had two amazing Gallardias, uh, and to not be recorded saying this, I'm not a huge Gallardia fan, but these were actually fantastic. Uh, these were also from Proven Winners, uh, the Heated Up series. This is Scarlet, and then they had Yellow, uh, and we planted them both in Sun and Part Shade. In Part Shade, they were fantastic. Again, more pollinators, you can see the bee right on this flower. Uh, but these were just really vigorous, great color to the landscape. Um, and this is what they looked like in, uh, this is what they looked like in full sun. Um, so not bad, still good flowering, but not quite as, they had much more dense flowering and much a more bright pop of color when they had the part shade. Uh, Lucky Star Pentas again crushed it at our trials this year, uh, especially the new color, lavender. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, it's, I think it's, we haven't tallied up all the votes, but I do believe it's gonna win the Consumer Choice Award. You can see some flags on it there. Uh, but really, again, we noticed that this Lucky Stars, this, the lavender's the new color, and you can just see that the fl individual flowers are open so much more than on most uh, pentas, and so the butterflies, they see that, and that's where they go for it. And so, it's, you can't deny it. Uh, Mojave Red Purslane Portulaca. This is kind of more of a, um, oh, I can't, a succulent type feeling plant. Um, you could kind of see we planted a lot of these plants together that were very similar, and this one just completely surpassed all of its competitors. This is, once it got hot and dry, we moved into those dry August months, this did crash. It needs to be really wet, but that's okay because the trials aren't just for the whole time and some plants aren't supposed to go into August. And this is not a plant made for a August drought, but when it's not a drought, this is amazing plant, great ground cover. Zinnias, um, we have a problem with zinnias getting leaf spot because it's so wet. In Louisiana, uh, if you've ever grown them when it's wet, you know the little white with the black rings uh, all over, just completely covering the zinnias. These from American Taki, the Precocia F1s, we didn't really see any leaf spot on them. They didn't last as long as some of the other zinnias, but while they were doing well, they didn't have a problem with the leaf spot, which was just amazing to us. And Scarlet was one of the colors that was probably the best. And then we have a uh, blend that also didn't show almost any leaf spot, uh, the tropical blend, also this F1 precocious. And then these are probably also going to end up being one of the top plants of the garden this year after we tally up the votes. Uh, Beacon and Patience. These are not the sun patients, they're shaded patients, 
but there's a lot of problems if you know patients with mildews, and these are the new urban patients that do not, are not susceptible to mildew, and again, we're really wet, and we put it to the test, and we didn't see any instances of mildew or problems on these beacon and patients. They were great, uh, especially the coral up here and the red. We did see um, the white variety of these didn't do too well, um, not too good with the white, and then the purple was kind of okay, but the coral and the red really were just outstanding. And these, again, are in full shade. Um, this is probably, I think, not probably, I can go ahead and say it. This is going to be the number one plant from our bedding trials. It, at no point did it not get a perfect score throughout the whole summer. Uh, these indeterminate sunflowers, I don't know if you know that, but a lot of sunflowers, your typical ones are going to grow one stalk, one big flower, fold over and die. These just keep branching and putting out flowers all summer long, nonstop. Uh, I was actually really worried because we got these in trial and plugs. I grow them out a little bit, and then I put them in the landscape. And the very first night I put them in the landscape, the deer ate these <laughs> to the ground. And I was, oh, no. So I put a little fence around it, and they came back perfectly. Uh, so you, know, you couldn't cut, you could cut off flowers every day for you, if you wanted and put them in your vase on your table and they're going to still produce flowers. So these were fantastic. Um, Ashley, our research associate who takes the data, these are her absolute favorites. Um, there are so many people that came out there this year's favorites, so I got to give it up to these and we'll see them again in the container trials. Uh, Joe Pieweed. It's not as well known, but it's a great pollinator plant, and this is a new one. It's Eupatorium euphoria ruby uh, from Darwin Perennials, and these are, you plant them in full sun, they attract pollinators, all types, not just butterflies or bees, but all kinds of pollinators. Uh, they are really deer resistant, too, so the deer will go right around them, so if you're really worried about a lot of deer problems, but you want to be able to have bedding plants in color, consider Joe Pieweed. Um, and it's something that not a lot of people know about, but it did great in our trials. These aren't new um, powwow echinaceas, but when we get some times people, or not, some, almost always, our trialing companies will send us competitor plants. And sometimes the competitor plants are just better. Uh, and powwow echinacea just really outperformed all the echinaceas that were sent with it. And um, there's two varieties. There's a white variety that actually doesn't do that well for us, but these wild berries do fantastic, again, with some, a little bit of partial shade in that second year uh, for Louisiana. Uh, Rudbeckia, this is one from a nursery in Louisiana, DuPont Nursery. This is early bird gold. This, has been, this is a seven-year planting going on. It comes back. It doesn't, they don't freeze. They just die, or they... they go dormant, we mow them over the top, they come back every year, just keep expanding to the point where sometimes it's a pain to cut them back, but I love them. And like anyone that comes in the garden when they're going, goes over and looks at these. And so they constantly get uh, consumer choice awards, year after year after year, get votes. So I keep putting this in there. It's not a new plant, but it's a fantastic one. Early bird gold, Rudbeckia. And then this plant, it's not your typical bedding plant annual, uh, but it is a root hardy tropical. And even in mild winter, this freezes back to the ground and it comes back every year, year after year. We got down to 12 degrees for a couple days in a row and it came, this is the exact plant came back. Uh, this is lime sizzler firebush. This was named a Louisiana super plant this year. Uh, Hamelia firebush, it's native to the Caribbean and I think Southern Florida. Uh, so it can be considered a native plant. Um, but this, I believe lime sizzler was found at a nursery here in Texas. I'm not positive about that, but I do believe that. Uh, it's just a, uh, a mutation where it's got this really dark or bright chartreuse color. And it's hard to see, but there's a little bit of variegation on the leaves. And you have the nice orange uh, tubular flowers. So it attracts hummingbirds. And it's also really good for uh, some, I think, eastern swallowtails lay their eggs on the firebush plant. So it's good for pollinators and hummingbirds. And 
So if, if you're not, so up here, it'll probably be about the same. Ours gets between three by three and five by five every year, and then it dies back to the ground. If you're in southern Florida, it's going to get eight foot tall because it's never going to freeze back, or it's rarely going to freeze. You're not here? Okay. Okay, yep. Yeah, it's, uh, when we go to north Louisiana, they're, they're iffy too, so... Uh, but in our trials, we, it comes back year after year after year. Uh, real quick, I'm going to talk about the container trials um, that we started. Uh, again, Lucky Star Lavender, probably the winner of the container trials. Fantastic plant, both landscape and in a container. Uh, tattoo vincas. These are great vincas uh, for containers. They do not do well in the landscape. These have to be in container plantings. Uh, it's just too wet to put them in the ground. Even in a raised bed, they don't do well. Uh, but in a container, they do fantastic. And this black cherry was a great color for us, one of the best performing colors. Beacon and Patience, again, just in 35% shade in a container, they did fantastic. Uh, no mildew at all. Uh, no issues, great full color, full plants. This one was really interesting because we can't get petunias to grow into the summer. Uh, but in this container, in just a 35% shade, these supertunia raspberry rush grew all summer long through to September when they started to kind of go out, which is really unusual for southern Louisiana. So they took the heat in the container, and I really think there's a potential for these in hanging baskets. Um, we'll probably try that next year if they send them to us. Maybe they will. Uh, some more zinnias. Uh, in the landscape, those precocious really outperformed for us, these zesties. But these zesties did so much better in containers. Um, they were fantastic. And the, this uh, purple was probably the best performing color and it just had the most vigorous, bright color and so many blooms. And then that same Sun Credible Helianthus uh, did fantastic in, in containers. You really couldn't kill this plant if you tried. It was perfect. Trust me, we tried. And so these were just fantastic indeterminate, probably my favorite indeterminate sunflower out there. I don't know, how much time do I have? Good on time? Four minutes. Four minutes, oh darn. All right, I, I went way too long on that. <laughs> 10, okay. Uh, so here's our, I'm just gonna go through some of my favorites of the long-term plantings. Um, I took this picture just a couple weeks ago. Y'all have them here. You, about a couple weeks ago, I know you smelled those osmanthus in your garden, sweet olives. Uh, they're usually white or buttery yellow flowers. And this isn't that uncommon of a plant, but remember, I'm not a plantsman, so I'm just learning these piney woods, and I love it. And this, with the orange flowers, stuck out like a sore thumb to me. I loved it. I think the smell is kind of like a, a citrus blossom that it reminds me of, but sweeter from back home. This is one of my favorite plants in the garden right now. Uh, I took this picture just a couple days ago, a week ago. I can't get through here without bringing up azaleas from Louisiana, uh, and Encore especially. This we took two days ago before our freeze. Uh, this is probably the best looking Encore we had right now, uh, autumn lilac. Uh, and they, they bloom even better in the spring, but right now this is a really strong bloom for us. Just a fantastic deep purple. Oh, screw it. Um, <laughs> Southgate Road, I, from North Carolina, I've been going up there my whole life to my grandmother uh, and spending time in the mountains, and I love rhododendrons. And we can't grow rhododendrons in Louisiana at all. Um, but Southern Living put out these a uh, while back, Southgate series. They stay pretty short, but they give you that same rhododendron feel like you're hiking in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, they need 100% shade. Any sun will burn these and fry these, but we still get great blooms around April. Um, this is Divine is white. Brandy is a pink one. And then Grace is like a really light rosy pink. But they're all great, but Divine was my favorite. It was most a vigorous plant uh, flowering one we had. 
This isn't anything special, but Chinese snowball viburnum, people always see this uh, in the spring from the road, and uh, so many people actually pull in just because they see this tree or the shrub and want to know more about it. The blooms are this big, big softball size right here, They're, and so profuse throughout the, the canopy. Here you can see up close, this big. Um, deciduous magnolias are probably also some of my absolute favorites, and since I've been to the garden, I've changed my mind on the, there was a little girl series put out by the National Arboretum that I really like, uh, but this one is not part of that series, and I think this has now become my favorite deciduous magnolia. Uh, Alexandrina, it's not a misspelling. Um, it's just this really thick, leathery flower, so dense, uh, white on the top, purple underneath bottoms, just gorgeous in February, especially if you get a really cold winter. This is on the ground, it looks amazing. And people say that deciduous magnolias, they're only good for like three or four weeks, but I think they make uh, amazing trees throughout the year, just great foliage tra shade trees. And even when there's no leaves, no flowers, they're a really nice structure tree too. They bring structure to the garden. So there's something good for every season there. My second favorite one, uh, is John John Magnolia. It's a hybrid magnolia, uh, deciduous magnolia. Uh, not as pronounced purple, but still that white and purple coloration. Um, more dense foliage, and this is great because it comes on later. So if the Alexandrina is in full bloom in February, this will be in full bloom in March, so it just extends that period. We have quite a few a collection of yellow magnolia hybrids out there that are just amazing, and I wanted to highlight some of them just to go through real quick and show you. Uh, this is Gold Cup. It's got a really tight uh, flower on it. You can see how it looks there looking straight on. This is my favorite of the yellow magnolias. This is Butterflies. That color is just fantastic. This is a collector plant. Uh, I'll show you why in a real quick. This is why. It's not as dense of uh, flowerings throughout, so you're not going to get a whole bunch of this uh, flowers on it like you will some other deciduous magnolias, but it gives you that color. So it's really good if you're like me and just a plant geek collector. Uh, this is another one, more profuse flowering, but less uh, intense color, banana split. And here you see it really covers the tree. That's the whole tree of banana split. You can see the butterflies behind it. Uh, Annie Lou, uh, it's got that same color but rolled up uh, petals. Uh, just a really interesting yellow magnolia. It flowers later, as you can see, still some green leaves or some green new green leaves on it. Uh, really neat. So again, these just keep uh, in sequence flowering, which just makes the garden so amazing. This is what it looks like just without flowers on it. Honey Liz, a really small one, kind of looks like a rose. Oops, oops, oops. There you go. Uh, and some other of my favorite um, plants out there that I really like, deciduous uh, flowering trees. Uh, I really, I love fragrant ones as well, and so these flowering apricots are hard to beat. Uh, this is Peggy Clark, Prunus, Prunus Mumi. Um, the pink, everyone likes it. It's so strong a smell, and it's fantastic. And I love it, but this lesser-known one is I like much more. It's not as big in the trade. Fragrant Snow, it's white, and it's so much stronger of a, a fragrance to it. Um, when I walk into the Piney Woods, probably in February-ish, 100 yards away, you can smell this tree. No joke. It is so fragrant. One of the most fragrant trees I've ever experienced. We only have two of them there right next to each other, and I can smell it from all around the garden. So that is amazing to me. Um, red buds, again, North Carolina, I love the eastern red buds. We can't really do eastern red buds. We do, but they don't do so well in uh, Louisiana. But the Chinese red bud, it's a really small, inconspicuous plant, but it's got this great color flowers on it. Uh, this is Don Egolf, and then during the year, bop, bop, it, uh, it's just a nice foliage plant. 
Some gardenias that I really like, again, love the fragrant flowers. These gardenias remind me of my grandmother's house when I was a kid, and so I've always just loved the gardenias. This is a really big, robust gardenia called Sweet Tea. It's from Bailey First Editions. Um, Baseball-sized flowers. I think I have an up close of a flower, yep. Just a really neat, traditional, good gardenia. Probably one of the better, more vigorous ones we have at the station. But if you want to look at some more uh, wild ones, this is Martha Turnbull. I believe this is a Greg Grant selection. Uh, so you probably have it here. I just love the pinwheel on it. It's just so unique. Uh, it's hard not to have that catch your eye. Uh, this is one also one I really like, Gold Doubloon. Uh, it's a strong chartreuse uh, yellow uh, gardenia. I don't, it doesn't have quite as strong of a smell, but it's got the good flowers. And when you look up, it's got a little bit of shade. You can kind of see. It's got a little bit of variegation, which just gives it a little more hint. Uh, I believe this was kind of released by Martin Vanderdeesen Nursery in Alabama. Uh, or promoted by him. That's where we got it. Uh, this is my favorite gardenia, hands down. It was in the trade long ago. It's kind of fallen out. Uh, variegated gardenia, I believe. It's called Gardenia Jasminoids Variegata. Uh, that's just amazing to me. Uh, complete shade on this. It does bloom, but it's kind of inconspicuous blooms, which is an amazing variegated color gardenia. It's so unique. I don't know why that fell out of favor. Beauty berries, Calicarpa. Um, we really like these. We're actually doing some work on selecting blue, uh, beauty berries currently right now. I'm looking for really compact. These bring a lot of songbirds to your landscape. A lot, some people don't like them um, because they're kind of wild and stringy and they look more woodsy plants, but we like that. Uh, deer like them too. But they really bring a lot of birds, and I like to sit and look at my bird feeders so I could plant calicarpa out there and sit on my porch and look at these just as well. Uh, all different color berries, whites, pinks, deep purples, uh, but I really just, I love the just straight purple one. But some really fun ones, and these aren't the Americanas you must think of. This is calicarpa dichotoma duet. It's a variegated calicarpa. Uh, really small and conspicuous. It does have the berries, they're white, but they're not really noticeable. But this is just a really neat plant. Uh, smaller leaves is the dichotoma. There you can see, I think there's some berries on here somewhere, like right there. They're just, it's not known for its berries, but it's more of a foliage plant. Uh, Woodlander's burgundy. So like I said, you can get some really deep, deep purples on these uh, calicarpas. And this one is Snowstorm, this is a japonica. A lot of people don't like the japonicas because uh, they can be a little invasive. But with this just intense uh, variegation, it's just a fantastic plant. Uh, Japanese maples, I just got back from visiting North Carolina uh, last week with my family. And so I saw all the fall color. So I wanted to point out something that gives us some really neat color. The Japanese maples can do it uh, in southern Louisiana. Uh, just a couple. We have a massive collection of Japanese maples. Unfortunately, a lot of them have died from our 2016 floods. We still have some that are going good. Just wanted to point out some of the really neat ones. Wildfire, it's got this really orangey uh, stems, and so when it loses its leaves, it kind of looks like a stick figure of a, a bonfire. It's really neat. Not all plants are only for their leaves and foliage or flowers. Sometimes the stems are just as uh, attractive. This one's my favorite one because this is like the most bright red we can get in Louis southern Louisiana. Glowing embers, um, Japanese maple. It's just a fantastic one. And that's it. Um, this is just uh, the Hammond Station. We have, they call them the sister oaks. They're about 180 year old live oaks. There's two of them next to each other. One was knocked half of it out in Katrina. This is the other one. It's on the live oak registry. And it is just a gorgeous plant, and that's what you see when you first pull into the Hammond Station. So, I know that was fast, but if you have any questions, I'm here. If you got time. Good question. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.